Okay, so final session, which is around impact. And uh, Andy is going to lead this session. Andy? Thanks, Alan. Um, I'll just wait for everybody to reconvene, rejoin. Um, so th this session's about impact. But, uh, but before we start, I wanted to just conduct a little Mentimeter survey of my own. And um, I wanted to ask the group, if you could just raise your hands in answer to this, please. We'll do it that way. Um, who goes to work with the feeling that they want to make a difference? Okay. That's interesting. We've touched on these things already a number of times this morning. Um, who of you is actually making a difference? Not, not quite so many. I'd just be interested to know what the rest of you are doing. But um, the question really is, and uh, this isn't for a show of hands, but how do you actually know that you're making a difference? And how do you, in other words, measure that impact? And one of the things we've been doing as SEBI with the foundation is to help them find the mechanisms of determining, determining impact at various scales. And this particular slide uh, came from Shannon in the foundation, at least that's how we got it. And it talks about impact really at a number of different scales. And we have been asked to work with other Gates grantees to look at their outputs and eventually outcomes and develop con common indicators of performance across those grants. And then potentially combining those into a, a portfolio level. And then also we have above that, if you like, national regional level and above that the, ho the whole sector. So the purpose of this morning's session really is to explore some aspects of impact at those different levels. I wanted to say and just acknowledge that at the grantee and portfolio level, um, as far as the portfolio is concerned, we're working with the foundation, as I mentioned, and we've heard a discussion about their um, bodies of work, being animal health, production and systems, and we've been working in SEBI particularly at the moment mostly with the animal health and uh, production. And for example, we're working with Galvmed um, on, on uh, their outputs, we're working with SIDI, we're working with Lander Lakes or whatever they're called now, is it Venture 37? Is that right? Thank you. Uh, we're working with Zoetis, um, who else are we working with? Work we're working with BAFE and um, ADGG we're working, and uh, an, a number of other grantees. And uh, obviously we value that uh, collaboration we're having with those colleagues. And uh, um, I was going to say we're enjoying that work. Uh, that's possibly a little overstatement, but we're, uh, <laughs> we're, we're getting through that work, I think, quite effectively now. So that's what this morning's about. Um, there will be a slight uh, change of schedule to that published due to timing problems and we're going to start with looking at the livestock sector as a whole and I wanted to introduce Roswitha to come and speak to us on that. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm uh, very glad that I have the chance to talk to you here in this very interesting meeting. And well, I was to talk, uh, asked to talk on the sector level, tracking progress towards achieving the sustainable development goals. And uh, just to remind you that the 17 sustainable development goals of the 2030 agenda have been adopted by the member countries in 2015. 
And well, you asked me to talk about this topic, but here's a small reminder. We have 17 goals, and under these 17 goals, we have 169 targets. And for these 169 targets, we have 230 indicator, indicators. And some of these indicators have sub-elements. So I'm not going to present now these 230 indicators because this, in fact, how um, the impact is measured based on these indicators towards achieving a target. I want to give you just a small example, and based on this example, we can see the problems, the issues, and maybe can talk about possible solutions and how to assist countries. I want to focus on one target and um, the Sustainable Development Goal 2, which is very important also in FAO's work, because this is the goal on ending hunger, achieving food security, and improved nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture. So this is really the heart of FAO's mandate. And we'll focus here on target 2.5 and two of its indicators. And here you see a classical example how targets are formulated. So targets are formulated by policymakers, not by people thinking about how to measure impact. It's a nicely formulated and one target under this sustainable development goal says by 2020, which is now, so nobody asked me whether we should put 2020 because it was clear from the beginning that we are not going to achieve the target in 2020. By the way, <coughs> most likely will be put forward to 2030 with the same content and the same wording. So by 2020, maintain the genetic diversity of seeds, cultivated plants, and farmed and domesticated animals and their related wild species, including through soundly managed and diversified seed and plant banks at the national, <laughs> regional, international levels, and promote access to and fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from the utilization of genetic resources and associated traditional knowledge as internationally agreed. Okay, how do we measure achieving this target? <coughs> Imagine, can you do this with one simple indicator? No. Under this target, two indicators have been developed. One indicator with a plant and an animal element and a second animal indicator. I will focus, as I think these are, we're talking about livestock data, on these two indicators which um, use data from the livestock sector. And these are the two indicators. Uh, I don't know, I think many of you do have a background, not only in statistics, but also with livestock, as I heard from this very nice introduction round. So I can use um, the normal terminology here. So the first indicator says um, it's the number of animal genetic resources for food and agriculture secured in either medium or long-term conservation facilities. What does this mean? It refers to the number of local breeds. There's a clear definition what is a local breed with material stored within gene banks. So it's cryoconserved material. And this material should be sufficient to reconstitute the breed in case of extinction. And the second one refers to breeds at risk of extinction. So how this is reported? Countries, and there's a specific person in each country, report basic data to FAO, because FAO is custodian of these indicators, and enter this data into the that is the domestic animal diversity information system. In case of the first indicator, it's cryoconserved material like semen embryos. In the second one, it's population sizes. And based on population size, risk of extinction is calculated with a very simple formula. The logic is the less animals per breed, the higher the risk of extinction. Well, and then that is calculates these indicators on the national level and then there's a certain uh, algorithm to aggregate on the regional and global levels. <coughs> the impact is um, easy to measure or the indicators are simple to interpret. Uh, if the number of breeds with sufficient material stored increases, we make progress towards the target. If the proportion of breeds at risk decreases, we make progress towards the target. So the indicators as such are very simple. The problem is, <coughs> the data are also simple, you could think. 
we have a lot of um, um, data gaps, a lack of data in many countries, and the indicators cover only a part of the target. Remember how the target 2.5 was described? There was a lot of access and benefit sharing. Nothing is covered with these indicators. So even the small target cannot be covered with two indicators. Now we come to the SDGs. We have 70 sustainable development goals. How to measure progress towards to these 17 sustainable development goals with 169 targets and 230 indicators? Well, I'll give you just one example. If we intensify the production, the livestock production, well, we might have progress towards target two. We reduce hunger. We uh, might also reduce the environmental burden of livestock production, emission intensities, very po good, positive. But on the other hand, while going in this direction, we compromise most likely also animal welfare, human health, by the use of antimicrobials, by increased risk of cases and spread of zoonotic diseases. This is one of the risks. And <coughs> especially in this case, it's very likely that we reduce animal genetic diversity. So this is the indicators we just saw before. And we lose diversity. So you see, between these goals, there are a lot of there are synergies, but there are a lot of trade-offs. So if you want to learn more about synergies and trade-offs and understand livestock sector and the sustainable development goals, I warmly recommend this publication to you. Many of you might have read it already and think how we can measure this with data. If you want to learn more about the data of these two specific indicators I presented, please have a look at the DADIS, the Domestic Animal Diversity Information System. Thank you very much for your attention. Well done, yes, uh, indeed, and that's what we need. Thank you very much, and I, I should have explained we needed to change that schedule because Rosalita has to leave uh, uh, quite, quite soon. So thank you for bearing with us, and sorry, Neil, I didn't explain that to you, but I'm going to invite you to come up now and at the other end of the scale, really, uh, to, to look at um, delivery from the, uh, from at the project level. Uh, I wanted to say that in line with the other sessions, we, uh, we'll go through the, pr the short presentations and then uh, have a discussion uh, at the end, facilitated by Alan, I think. Right, good morning. So th this is down to a very low level, of after having looked at a very high level. Um, what impact language do, do we speak at an organizational level when you've got interventions on the ground? Impact basically implies change. What change are we bringing about uh, attributable to, to, to our interventions? And in order to understand that, it's probably best just to have a look, little look at our impact pathway. So, so this is what is there at the moment. It's in the field before the intervention. We deal in animal health products. These are already being bought to a certain extent by smallholder customers. They have their livestock and they are getting benefit, deriving benefit from that livestock. That's what's there before, before our intervention starts. The difficulty with the situation, and this is the, the basis for, for Galfman's intervention, is that the burden of disease uh, depicted thus is high, and therefore that constrains uh, productivity and, and livelihoods. So our interventions are involved with developing new products and getting existing products out to the smallholders. Um, they are adopted by the smallholders, and that is depicted thus. No, no, no marginal changes here. That's, <laughs> that's grand stuff. Um, and that in itself leads to, to productivity changes, uh, which is depicted thus. But if you lower the burden of disease, you're effectively lowering the level of risk facing smallholders. And what you should be seeing is some sort of ancillary adoption of, of better inputs and practices. And that in turn, again, improves productivity uh, depicted thus. Collectively, that productivity gives rise to, to welfare uh, and, and livelihood benefits, depicted thus. And some of that uh, extra income, which is, is, is part of the welfare benefits, flows back into more, more products, and hence it is sustainable in the long run when working through the private sector. So that's all marvelous. That's how it works in theory. But what it shows is that there are distinct areas, there's dis distinct steps on this impact pathway where change happens. And we'll just look at a couple of examples of these. So first, if we look at adoption, this, this is a big one for us. We, 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 nothing's going to change unless there is adoption. So what are the rates of adoption that we get? 
here's one example. This is vaccine A. Uh, looking along the x-axis, that's a period of about two years there. And this is a fantastic example, because you see if you segment the smallholder customers, large, medium, small, you're getting 100% adoption in the large uh, category, 80% for the middle, 60% uh, for the small, in a period of 18 months to two years. So that's a really good one. This is a slide for the Ministry of Propaganda, if ever there was one. It's a nice one. Um, here, not such a good one. This is, a different, this is vaccine B, and this is after a period of three years of market development activity of private sector partners. You see area A, 50%, mm, well, that's okay. Areas B and C, definitely not so hot, 7 8%. What's going on there? And this is where in adoption studies, you can't just have the measures as we are seeing here, but behind this, there's a lot of information. The, the whole slide deck just for, for this one is about 100 slides long. And you see there's actually a very good reason why you're getting such low rates of adoption in areas in B and C. The smallholders are behaving rationally. There's no one uh, cause. There are lots of causes behind it. And understanding those causes, that again, that, that's the difference between success and failure for us. But okay, products are being adopted. What actually happens when they're getting into animals? And that's depicted thus, the productivity. Remember the steps on the impact pathway. Um, here, we'll start off with a good one again. And so this is a poultry vaccine, and this is basically baseline, end line, different difference of about a year. Just about all locations, apart from Tanzania, the bottom and the middle, you're getting significant increases in flock size. And if time permitted, we'll see that that uh, tr uh, translates through to, to offtake, increased offtake, off increased off income as well. So that's a good example. What about if you're looking at something a little bit more marginal here, just like dewormers, and you're looking at differences in, in weight gain after a period of about 60 days? Um, you see, for, uh, for example, on, on the poultry, you, you, you're getting about 50 grams difference in body weight of a, of, of a bird. What does that actually mean in terms of impact? What does that mean in terms of productivity? And what does that mean in terms of livelihoods? These are the questions we ask ourselves. But we're not a research organization. We're basically about getting products like, like dewormers out to the smallholders. So at certain times, or often, like this, we look and we basically shrug our shoulders. We have to admit we don't know. It looks like it's a good thing. But in terms of quantifying that good thing, in terms of productivity and livelihood, it's hard and it's costly. And as an implementation organization, is it really our place to be doing that? So finally, just moving over right over to, 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 to the far end of, of the impact pathway, what is happening in terms of livelihoods and welfare? I mean, we are effectively a charity. This is why, why we exist, and this is what, what, what we're interested in. But it's getting, this is now the hardest places to, to, to measure. So I'll just have one slide here very briefly, which maybe represents our sort of furthest point that we, we reach in, into to these welfare. And it, it goes back to that poultry vaccine we saw, or saw earlier. Now, you, as I said, you can see income increasing, uh, poultry income increases sort of between about 50 and $100 per year per household. But, and this is as far as we go in terms of asking the question, so when a vaccinator or an adopter is selling a bird, how is that money used? I mean, does it go and get used on booze, as people often say, or is it used to, so, to some good cause? And then comparing between adopters and non-adopters. And so you'll see some interesting differences, like. A lot more seems to be spent on, on household education and the adopters and, and the non-adopters, but less on health. But again, this just demonstrates maybe the, the limitations of organizations in the field. To what extent can you go and get that sort of data? There are a lot of assumptions here. How do you sort of trace back from our vaccine coming in to things like children going to school? It's difficult and it's costly. That's the main point we make. And so these sort of things we tend to bring out and show to you to in the research community and try and get interest there for people to come in and subsequently look at these things. Finally, the, the feedback, the all-important feedback, this is for our private sector our partners. This is critical. So we look, vaccine supply, this is an example. Five years later, nobody is involved in it. It's, it's, it's standing by itself. The vaccine supply has actually grown. The vaccine usage as well, it's still pretty healthy, 60%. So this is what we want to see in the long run. This really, this, 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 this test of time more than anything else determines what impact you're going to achieve in the field. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Uh, just tell you a short anecdote, actually, um, that when I was in Galvmed, we advertised for a particular position, and 
uh, invited the, uh, the shortlisted candidates for interview. And uh, we asked for a short presentation of eight minutes and five slides. And Neil was the only one that complied with that, so he got, he got the job. Um, I think you were on the cusp there a little bit, but we, uh, we'll, we'll accept that, Neil. So thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, we're moving on now to talk uh, about the portfolio level, and I wanted to invite uh, Andrew and Belinda, or Belinda is doing the presentation, yep, to talk about that. Both, okay. Okay. Yep. I wasn't sure which order, so late ladies first. Um, so I think the, f the favorite thing that I saw this morning that explains what Andrew and I are presenting um, was something on the mentee that said investment equals impact, question mark. Um, and so I think as we're looking at portfolio level, really what is the impact of our investments? What are we trying to measure? Whether the data are coming from grants or from national level data sets? And how are we sort of looking at um, whether we are making impact, in fact. Um, next slide, please. So I think I don't want to repeat too much of what anyone might have seen of our theory of change or the results framework that I know Hannah presented um, last year. But a refresher is always good, and there are some new participants who may or may not have seen our results framework before. So just to sort of run through it very quickly. Um, so as Andy was saying, we do have these three bodies of work, animal health, production, and systems. Um, and we sort of, looking from the bottom up here, systems supports the delivery of animal health and production um, that feeds into our four main strategic goals, productivity, income, nutrition, and women's empowerment. And we think about this at the smallholder farmer, farmer level. And all of those strategic goals sort of feeding up into this inclusive agricultural transformation. Um, next slide, please. <coughs> so if we think about um, within the expansion of the, the data, s the animal systems body of work, we've really um, sort of identified data as underpinning a fully functioning livestock system. Um, sorry, it might be easier if I, <laughs> can you just click through three? One more, okay. Um, so we think about data at all these levels. We have digital farm level data, grant level, sector level, national data, livestock systems that we'd like to support, um, and then sort of creating you know, what this community of practice does, trying to create reliable and relevant global data platforms. So I think when we talk about you know, impact at the grant level, we're really talk looking at this sort of grant and sectoral level data to see what we can combine at those different levels. Um, that will measure impact. So this is just another way to visualize this. Um, so sort of what we see on the bottom here is we can collect data from individual investment, monitoring, and valuation. That sort of rolls up into our body of work um, and portfolio targets. Um, on top of that, we have that layer around the four strategic goals of income, nutrition, women's empowerment, and productivity um, that drive inclusive ag transformation. So really looking at you know, across agricultural development, of which livestock is a part at the foundation, that high level impact and, and what are those strategic goal indicators. Um, and then also the sector level data. Um, sorry, can you click through one more? Um, so this is how we organize our results framework. And we sort of think about this in, in a few different levels. So at the bottom here, we have outputs from grants which are within our sphere of control. Um, at the portfolio level, then, we have these intermediate and primary outcomes that um, are within the sphere of influence and then um, rolling up into our strategic goals and impact goals, which is sort of in our, our sphere of interest or sphere of influence. And so this is our results framework. So we try to map all of our investments to these primary outcomes, which are the orange boxes. Um, you can see the four strategic goals across the top, um, and then the impact goal of inclusive transformation. So if we go to the next slide, um, you can sort of see within the different bodies of work, 
we have in investments that map to these different primary outcomes. So where we think we're making impact at a primary outcome level, um, then that's how we sort of map back to there. So in order to, to look at our whole portfolio and see if we're making impact, um, we've sort of consolidated a list of 10 headline goals. Um, and these are a mix of grantee data. So what Neil was presenting, um, the impact of GalvMed of delivery of products at the farmer level, how can we extrapolate that to net economic benefit? So for that indicator, data are coming from grantees. Um, for some of the indicators like percent of improved animals in a national herd or flock, those are coming from national data sets or some of the nationally representative, um, for example, LSMS or some of the other publicly available data sets. Um, next. So just as an example, um, SEBI's been doing these visualizations for us, um, and we anonymized this a little bit. So essentially, you know, by product um, or by vaccine sold, you can see sort of effective immunization coverage um, in the geographies we're interested in. Next, please. Um, if we look at percentage, so this percentage of improved animals in the national flock or herd, um, and then we compare that with, you know, percentage of households from a different data source, percentage of households rearing improved animals by species um, from the LSMS data. And then we can sort of see at the different levels from which we're collecting data, are we able to triangulate um, on improvements in, in sort of um, influencing improved breeds. Um, and then an example of the systems, a systems indicator, the share of total government budget allocated to livestock annually. So how are we looking at um, how much money governments are um, contributing to livestock per sort of its contribution to GDP and see if we can, can influence those numbers upwards. Next, please. Great, um, so I think, do I have a few minutes left? Okay, so um, the few questions that we were asked to touch on, um, what kind of impact do we measure? How often is it measured? Some of the methods used and confidence in the results. Um, so I think it really depends on the grant that we're doing. So which body of work does it lie in? How it rolls up to sort of the portfolio level? And there's been a lot of discussion around data quality over the last two days. Um, and I think when we look at, you know, what we're trying to impact as a portfolio and how we're trying to drive some of our strategic goals forward, um, the error bars on some of these can be very large. And so sometimes we're looking at trends versus, you know, can we just capture the trend versus perhaps the absolute value? Um, in, in what cases does it make sense to invest in better data quality um, or more data so that we can get a more precise estimate? Um, and so for, you know, if you look at the list of our 10 headline goals, for some of those, um, we may be more at the intermediate impact level, and we have high confidence to say that we can measure the amount of product that a grantee is delivering. Um, and then, but if we're looking at our theory of change and how that rolls up into those strategic goals, there are a few sort of missing steps along the way and assumptions that have to be made before we can say, and due to that delivery of AI, you know, the percentage of improved animals in the national herd is in fact um, increasing. And so how do we sort of draw those linkages and make those assumptions from some of the indicators at the grant level to some of the indicators that we're tracking at sort of the national or regional level? Um, so I think, I think that's all that I had for now. And I did wanna save some time for Andrew, so. Thank you. Andrew. Over to you, Andrew. Um, so first of all, um, an unintended impact of our security system is I can't actually access any of my files. So my slight apologies, this, uh, this is sort of what I had available on the remainder of my hard drive. Would you mind? I don't think there's too much animation or clicking. Um, so I'm in the Bureau of Food Security. It's not a Bureau of Livestock, it's the Bureau of Food Security, and it's going to change its name to be the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. 
So I think it's a really important thing that for, for USAID, livestock isn't an end goal. It, it's a means to an end. So everything, it, livestock is just a tool to achieve development outcomes. Perhaps a little bit in contrast to, to some of the comments that Neil made, we really are really just looking at the livelihood outcomes, the resilience and livelihood outcomes, and however we can best achieve that in a pretty competitive environment, and one that wasn't really very cognizant of the role that livestock can play. So, um, you know, a lot of these comments here are going to be not s livestock specific, and I would encourage us to, whilst we're a livestock community, to think about how livestock further advances other higher level orders. So our speaker earlier talked about the sort of linkages to the SDGs. And that's, that's a key part of our work. Um, so I chose this picture just to sort of like flag that the kind of areas that we work in, we're really looking at, at poverty alleviation, malnourishment, and some of the poorest parts of the world. And it's how livestock can advance those higher level outcomes. Um, next slide, please. So this is our results framework. It's at the food security level, and there's a lot of detail there. But the, the key point here is that we have three core objectives that all of the work needs to track to, uh, inclusive, sustainable, ag-led economic growth, strength and resilience amongst people and systems, and a well-nourished population. So I don't think we'll find the word livestock on that anywhere, um, but livestock, as I try to advocate internally, applies to it in most, if not all, of those locations. But again, the, it's all about the food security and livelihood outcomes that we're really we're striving for. And I think perhaps as has been said, but we're really focusing down on some of the more fragile countries and the, the lower economic groups. It's not livestock on a global sense, it's really targeted into core countries. And we have 12 specific focus countries where we work and a slightly wider group of aligned countries. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we measure? Um, we have a focus on productivity. Um, sustainable intensification, so we're measuring sort of input supply and some of the output markets. Um, we can achieve that quite effectively at the project level, at the commodity level, um, but it becomes extremely difficult to speak to that at the portfolio level. We're also pretty decentralized, so a lot of our funding goes through the missions and they determine how that's spent and the specific targeting. They need to fit broadly within that um, global food security strategy framework, but it's extremely broad. Most things fit in it. Um, our measurement is, is at two levels, and this is a little similar to the foundation in terms of your areas of, of, of implementation and, uh, and of influence. Um, the projects themselves are accountable to their direct beneficiaries, and they report on a suite of indicators around that. Um, there's a lot of indicators, as some of you implementers will know, um, many of them are output indicators that are really just helping us to understand that things, the money is being spent in accordance with the way the project documents, you know, that's what we approved. Um, it gets more and more difficult. We get fewer and fewer of the outcome indicators. We then try to look at how our program, how our individual projects are scaling at the, at the zone of influence. So a zone of influence typically is a part of a country usually selected for its agricultural potential, but it's the, the level and concentration of poverty in those areas. Um, then for those, um, for the zones of influence, what we measure in a slightly different way. Um, do we have the next slide? So sorry. The, just before we move on to the zone of influence. So individual projects, we have a suite of these standard indicators, and these are the four key ones that we look at for, that will uh, re directly relevant to sort of impact in, in the livestock sector, but they were all written with crops in mind. Uh, I think I may have tweaked the wording a little bit, but um, much of the metrics were designed for crop measurement, and that has become quite challenging in terms of adapting it to livestock systems where You've particularly in systems that are mobile. Uh, so I'm just quickly, you know, the no sorry, go back, sorry. Um, but we've really struggled with measuring yield. Uh, we have massive inconsistencies in how it's measured, and that makes aggregation of data particularly difficult, despite quite extensive uh, performance indicator reference sheets, which are very lengthy documents for those of you who are aware of them that give guidance on exactly how to measure with the intention of standardization. But it, simply became too difficult. So 
our M&E team, when I was asking them about this, um, they basically said that at the livestock level, at the portfolio level, we, we simply can't aggregate results between projects and roll that up between the different projects in different countries. The methodologically, the quality of the data that we're getting is just isn't strong enough to do it. Um, one improvement that we have made is that we now measure context indicators. We would previously not note whether or not it was a good year or a bad year. So they could be a major drought, uh, there could be a whole ton of crop pests or livestock diseases, um, and we weren't really capturing that. So we could get an, a fairly sort of ordinary result, which was actually a very good result in a bad year, but that wasn't captured. So we're now um, collecting a lot through remote sensing in a lot of cases, context indicators to try to balance some of the performance against the prevailing uh, you know, agroecological conditions. Uh, next slide. We also focus quite a lot on resilience as a key characteristic and a reason if people don't have it as to why they're currently falling back into poverty. So this is actually um, just looking at emerging infectious diseases. We struggle to classify animal disease as a risk, um, it, which gives some indication of the sort of lower priority that's placed on livestock and, and in this case livestock diseases, drought, conflict. There are a number of other higher order shocks and stresses that a lot of our farmers face. And our measurement approach to resilience is a whole suite of information on that. Um, but it, essentially, we measure normal um, outcome indicators, and we look at how badly they're hit when a shock strikes. So there's no specific resilience indicator. It's a question of tracking the impact of a shock on, on the indicators that we already measure. Uh, next slide. An improvement that we hope will, will sort of play through our system is previously we made no attempt to disaggregate impact that was achieved by the production system. So we were just talking about kilos of livestock products, of meat, and that could be in an intensive system in a peri-urban setting of a fattening feedlot, or it could be comparing with the extensive rangeland system. And they, they're clearly so different that it was a bit meaningless to aggregate that together and then to sort of just sell that as a result. So we now have a separation of, of the different, before we tried to simplify it as much as possible, we recognize this is a gross simplification on, on the great work that FAO did, a lot of this is based on that, and that in itself was, was in something of a simplification, but we're hoping that this will at least nuance some of our findings a little bit. We also do a, uh, make a big point of gender disaggregated data. This is runs through all the data that we collect, and I think we've done a reasonable job, along with our colleagues at Gates, in, in doing that. Sorry, next. Oh, I'm sorry. Could we just go back one slide? Just so, so I just wanted to point out that when we do the population-based surveys, so this is in the zone of influence, outside of our direct project beneficiary areas, but the sort of ripple effect that we're looking for, they're trying to change this system change. Those population-based surveys are actually providing quite a detailed database. They're somewhat akin to the 50, 20, 30 uh, survey work that we heard about yesterday, but they're specific for the zones of influence. And this is open public data, so I think it's probably quite hard to get to, but I would encourage uh, data scientists that there's a wealth of information here. It's not very livestock specific, although in countries where they prioritize a livestock value chain, there's a separate module on that value chain. But there's a broad swath of data on household levels, somewhat similar to the World Bank and the, and the, and the 50, 20, 30 initiative. But I, I would sort of try, and that's one of my sort of takeaways from this meeting, is to try and make sure that that's in the hands of people that might want to play with it. Sorry, a couple more slides. Um, what we are now shifting towards is more of a food systems approach. So we're getting even further away from livestock productivity and looking right through the whole suite of a food system. So looking at consumption and food, you know, that kind of data. And with it, we're probably going to shift to a different uh, metric. And we talked about trying to influence and shape policymakers' minds. The ag GDP is a key performance indicator that a lot of policymakers are interested in. So we probably but, but the problem there is that in the livestock sector, we're not capturing any of the downstream uh, benefits. So we just stop at the farm level, and that's what's reported. When in fact, the processing, the traders, right down through to consumption, there's a lot more benefits, particularly in livestock products. So we're now going to shift to a, an Ag GDP Plus indicator, and that, we hope, is capturing more of a food system perspective on some of the benefits that are happening. Um, we might skip through these. 
So that's just to show for the 12 different countries. This is work that IFPRI are supporting, and we're, we're working with IFAD on this as well. But these are the, just the 12 different focus countries that we work in, and it helps to give the share of the of the benefits from the productivity farm level and then the downstream benefits. Uh, like, and then we'll skip that one, thanks. I think it just was important to say what we don't measure. Um, the, the multifunctionality of livestock is rarely captured. Some of the risk management, the financial services, we don't really capture crop interactions. Um, and essentially all this contributes and rolls up to a massive undervaluing of the impact that our programmers are having. Um, we struggle with greenhouse gas emissions at the moment to measure that, so we're very glad that others are doing great work on that. Um, we, through sustainable intensification, are reducing the emission intensity, so we hope that we are taking it into account while, whilst not specifically measuring it. Uh, next slide. Uh, a final slide. It was just really just to highlight, uh, my colleagues really wanted to point this out, was we, we spend a lot of money on, on monitoring evaluation, and we still really struggle with trying to understand what the results actually mean. Uh, this was an example looking at um, milk production. Uh, we had a torrid time trying to just capture how much milk's actually produced, huge amounts of biases, recall, different problems. Um, we then, in this analysis, we, in the first year, um, we, we went from like the blue, it's the blue bars that are of sort of of interest, that we went from 2.3 to 3.3, so we thought things were going well. And then in the third year, it went back down again, and it took forever to try and work out what was going on there. And we believe we probably crowded in a lot more people who were in the dairy sector, but they were operating at a much smaller scale and they weren't adopting as many interventions. So it was a positive result, but it took an immense amount of time. And the, the techniques that we use for survey work, those sort of baseline, midline, and endline, really not suited to understand this data. We have to go back and go through a whole different level of impact assessment to try and understand the result that we'd actually got. And I think that's it. One, one just show one. Yes, thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Andrew. Um, so we've covered the, uh, the global sectorial. We've talked about portfolio level and also at the, at the project level. And the, the last uh, talk is going to be more at the national, but it's a, a bit of a hybrid between national and project in a way. And I, I just wanted to give a bit of background to this. Uh, I'm going to introduce Giles in a moment. But um, one of the uh, original SEBI deliverables was to look at uh, mortality rates of ruminants in three countries, Nigeria, Tanzania, Ethiopia. Uh, which we duly went out and did using various methods. And, uh, but one of the things that cropped up during the time was what is the actual validity of that indicator as a measure of animal health status, animal disease status in a particular country. So having collected that data, we wanted to get a kind of critique, an evaluation of, of the validity of that and what it actually means in epidemiological, statistical, math mathematical terms. And that's where Giles and his organization uh, BIOS came in, and I'm going to hand over to him to tell us about that. Thank you. Uh, so, although it's, called although it's called the analysis of mortality at the national level, what I'm concentrating on today is the utility of these data to evidence impact. Okay. Okay. Wrong way. Uh, <laughs> okay, so and I'm going to concentrate today just on Ethiopia and just on mortality in small ruminants, not for any particularly good reason, apart from the fact that when I came to write this talk, these were the set of graphs that I could find uh, that I'd already produced. So there's nothing special about Ethiopia. There's nothing special about mortality in small ruminants. It's just somewhere to start if they give us uh, a good insight. And we're looking at two separate uh, data sets, the disease outbreak and vaccination reporting data set, DOVAR, which is monthly recording um, outbreaks of notifiable diseases in livestock. And we had access to several years data from 2009 to 2017. I'm also been talking about the living standard measurement study, integrated surveys on agriculture, which from now on I will call, for obvious reasons, just LSMS. 
biannual survey. It's an economic survey uh, done by the World Bank. Um, and I've put unknown sampling strategy. They have it, and they do publish what it is. But as far as we're concerned, it, it's sort of unknown. And certainly, um, it's not meant to be represented representative of agriculture or the livestock industry, it's meant to be representative of the national economy, which is somewhat different. Um, and you've probably all seen this before, this so-called pyramid of disease. Um, so we have a lot of infection, relatively less clinical disease, of which fewer animals die, um, even less recognition of why they died then reporting, tested, and finally becoming a statistic. So, in fact, the statistic is a very small part of what's really going on. And what I want to stress here is that although I've produced it as a nice pyramid, it doesn't necessarily look like that. Okay, so the, how peaked it is changes. So, for example, if you're looking in the UK at foot and mouth disease, um, then... Infection, yeah, okay, we get a certain level of infection, much less clinical disease. Animals die, now that depends on whether we're talking about animals dying from the infection, in which case there are none in the UK, or whether we're talking about culling, in which case there are actually more animals culled than were infected. And what we actually use as our statistic is the number of animals that we cull. So in fact, our statistic for foot and mouth disease, for example, during an outbreak, is in fact larger than the level of infection in the UK during an outbreak. Um, but if we just look at Dovart, and this is across all causes of mortality uh, in small ruminants over time, and what I want to stress here is the scale. So this goes from 10,000 down to 1,000, so in, if I get the right year, 2011, there were just under 10,000 small ruminants reported as having died from notifiable diseases. Whereas, one, two, three, four, five years later, in 2015, there were just over 1,000. So that's a tenfold decrease. And if you'd asked me a week ago, did I believe that, I would have said no. However, I've rethought what I think now, and I think, yes, that is, that is what was reported. But again, it's this idea of this pyramid of disease, okay? And what gets reported is not necessarily representative of the risk. And I don't believe, with some evidence, that the risk actually decreased tenfold over those years. It might have decreased, I don't know. I don't have any access to what was going on in the country. But what was reported decreased tenfold. And there can be all sorts of reasons why that happened. So in summary, for the Dovar data, mortality differs by region, year, and disease. Disease pattern changes across regions and years. And even within a region, you don't have the same pattern of disease year on year. So this is really complex data. There's nothing simple. And there is no way that I can give you a, a sensible summary statistic of these data. One question we might ask is, why is there so much variability? And if we now go to the LSMS, we get some insight into why there is so much variability. So we have 6,500 holdings, of which 82% said they had no deaths, which may or may not be correct, I don't know. Um, but the non-zero deaths are highly clustered. So you don't get very many who only had one death, but you do get an awful lot. The average group size was 10 animals. You get out of 10 animals, you would expect an awful lot of them would, would be showing eight or seven or five. Okay, so they're very clustered in space and in time. And that is the problem with mortality. Using mortality as some sort of measure of impact most of the time you get nothing. Every so often you get an awful lot. So in conclusions, I think mortality is not a good indicator. Uh, we can talk about the pyramid of disease and how that varies over time and in space. Preponderance of zeros, highly clustered, difference, difficult to use this to evidence change. And we could say, well, okay, would just the number of outbreaks be better? And I just did a quick back of an envelope calculation here. So if you have an average of two per year, 
If that drops down to zero and you get no outbreaks a year, you need to have no outbreaks for three years before, as a statistician, I will say, yes, you've got a significant change. If you go from two to one, which we might think is actually really good, you, s you now need 15 years of getting only one before I will say that is statistically significant. What could we use as an alternative? Yeah. What could we use as an alternative? I would suggest that, in fact, some sort of productivity is a better. So what I've suggested is perhaps the number of offspring reared, reared to one year might be a better indicator. Less variability there, particularly if you do it per adult animal. That's me. Um, thanks very much, Giles. And uh, I just wanted to say um, he, uh, he undersold that a little bit because there's a lot of very uh, complex uh, mathematical information behind all those, uh, th those statements. So uh, thank you for that. I'm going to hand over at this point to Alan, who's going to lead a discussion, I think. Great. Thanks, Andy. And thanks to all the presenters. Um, we need everyone around tables because we're going to do a bit of table work now. Um, so we have six tables, few uh, spare seats. So if you could come forward and just join a table. We're going to use the same process as we used on day one. So we've had uh, presentations about measuring impact at different scales from the SDG level, Roswitha, the portfolio level from the donor side, the national level um, on mortality data and uh, at the project level. Um, so the, your task for the next 10 minutes or so is in your table groups, um, have a conversation about what you've heard, um, come up with some kind of consensus on either a question you want to ask the presenters or a challenge that you want to make to the presenters. Okay, so it's either a question or you need to pose a challenge. And it can be at any level from the SDGs right down to the project level. And we'll, we'll do that for 10 minutes or so and then we'll do a bit of roving mic. Group one, what's, who's your spokesperson? Kara. Thank you everyone for the presentations, they were really great. So we were talking about uniformity across the scale. So our challenge is how do we get a common metric across the scales from project level to impact or common metrics? So common metrics from SDGs right down to project level. Who wants to, I'm not gonna give you all a chance, but who feels strongly about that? No? So we move on to group two. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, do you want to try that? Yeah. So, so at, at, at the low project level, I mean, we, we, if, if we are required, and it will normally come from the donor to, to, to collect data in, in, a, in a particular way, then, then, then it's easy. We, 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 we do it like that. But we, we, we have our preferred ways, which is adapted to our own particular initiatives. So in general, our, our data won't, if you know, just left to our own devices, our data will not necessarily talk to another grantee's data. We have to be kind of corralled and shepherded in that way. Okay. Anyone else? Andy? I'm, I'm not really going to answer it, sorry, but I, I, I wanted to kind of ac acknowledge the problem and it relates very much to the conversation that Shannon and I had just a few minutes ago and it would be nice to see that pathway actually that runs through from the, from the project level, from the level that Neil was talking about up, up to that sectorial uh, S SDG level and maybe that's something we could think about as a, a, a future uh, issue to, to address within the community. But can't answer it now, but maybe it's something we could, we could think about, yeah. I, I but my other, my other response is we should refer it back to the group to see what, the, what they think about it. <laughs> I think one thing that would help is if we could find a metric that we could actually evidence as being useful across the different scales. And I suspect that's going to have to be some sort of economic metric. 
Okay, moving on. Uh, group two, who's your spokesperson? Hugo. Uh, here we have uh, a different challenge. Uh, we believe that the issue is that we are trying to use the same metrics because uh, what works at small scale does not work at aggregate level. In the sense, you know, that uh, we can increase productivity in one farm and if we start increasing productivity in all farms, then what happens at a greater level, you know, is that the price goes down. So at the end, farmers will be worse off. And I think at aggregate level, a key indicator could be really the price, the real price for consumers. And, you know, uh, if you think, you know, at, um, in the industrial world, we have few farmers and less, and yet, you know, the price for, of food for us is very cheap. And if you go on Africa, you know, we have a lot of farmers and then the price for consumers is very high. So we have this sort of contradiction that we have projects that work very well, you know, for some indicators. But then if we tend to use the same indicator at another level, then it's a paradox. You know, you want a lot of farmers being productive and then w they will not be very profitable. So that's a bit of a challenge that we are facing. Okay, Andrew. So I think you know, it is, it is a conundrum. I would just point out that as we pivot to a food system approach, cheap food is a huge positive outcome. Um, that 75% of all poor people, even if the farmers are spending 60% of their income on food in the market. So if the food price goes down, that's a massive positive. So it's a little challenging, you know, we sort of, it, yes, there is potentially some issues for farmers, um, and you have to hope that the productivity will compensate for the reducing price or the alternative and growing markets will actually increase demand and that that increased supply won't actually result in a reduced price. I'm, I'm not an economist, I'll let Annie answer that one. But, um, but I think, you know, just to see this is that we've always seen this from a farmer, a livestock keeper's point of view. And I think we may need to just take a breath and just have a little bit of a step back and see this as a, as a food system perspective. As we're seeing fewer and fewer people, farmers, how do you get the poor people down? It's in things like food prices, job creation in food systems, and so on. So it's the balance between production, producer benefits, and consumer benefits. Mario? Yes, and, and just to make a comment, and that has a lot to deal with structure then. Because actually, if prices start coming down, you will need bulk, and you will need to, to create, to have more cows, larger herds, uh, and things like that to be able to maintain a profit level. So, because for a small holder, this, this, this will not work. And in, in unsaturated markets, that, will, that, that is essential to think about how we create this change uh, to be able to make really profitable, prosperous livelihoods. I think, associated with this demand and supply. So it's the transition, but the question is then what happens to all the people who, the s uh, all the smallholders, yeah. Tim. I just want to ask a question. Um, is this a second question from your group? Uh, a little bit. We have a challenge, and now we're doing a question. So I said no, just one question or a challenge. I'm, a I'm in a group of my own. Uh, so. Do we need to stay with a small holder frame of mind? Like, uh, is it implicit in everybody in the d in the donors' goals that small holders is the way forward, or can that change? Well, there's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the reminder, Mario. Uh, <laughs> so current. Currently, as our target population, that's where we would like to try and measure impact. And so I think, you know, it's, it behooves us to think forward to some of these changes and how the, what the transition looks like and what the trajectories of these people look like. We're definitely not trying to keep smallholder farmers small, but I think for the measurement systems, where the bulk of where we want the impact is, sort of sits within that cohort for now. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of interest in this transition. I just want to supplement Belinda's answer as a colleague at the foundation, and I think that we had this conversation at this table, and we are very acutely aware that if we do our jobs well, we are going to lose participants in the smallholder livestock sector, and that, and that is not something that we want to impose, but we welcome. 
as the foundation if we're driving at economic empowerment. And that means that families have the choice to drop off the farming system and move into more peri-urban or business that's off farm. That That's completely acceptable within our framework and what we're driving at. And so our worst case scenario is that we are trapping farmers in smallholder business that they want to transition out of. Yeah, OK. Obai? Yeah, just to comment also on that, I think it's, it's important to follow the, the systems approach and having as a primary objective uh, getting the market to function for the poor. Uh, because the poor are poor because the market are not working for them. So we cannot exclusively work in improving the market just for a smallholder farmer. I think the idea is that many of our investments are actually for the whole market. If you look at health, for example, we cannot just limit ourselves to working with a smallholder farmer. So what we have been measuring, if you look at also specific uh, animal health interventions, maybe with Zoetis, with companies, otherwise, uh, it's really about the whole market. Knowing that part of this is going to create the traction that is needed to benefit eventually the smallholder farmer, uh, but that's why we are also thinking internally about uh, using another term, which is the poor livestock keepers or small-scale producer, rather than just limiting ourselves to, uh, to, put to people who have very small number of assets. Okay, Odede and then Mario, and then we move to table three. The purpose of all these interventions is to move people up from the status quo. So a good intervention to a smallholder farmer is to increase their productivity and pro profitability. And practically on the ground, you find with good interventions at a farm, you may find a farmer with one cow. You advise them well. You go there after two or three years, you find there are five, ten cows. And the positive output, if you have many people moving up the scale, a lot of integration comes within the value chain and people will find other engagements within the, the value chain. And then uh, the overall goal of economic growth comes to life. So we shouldn't be scared of having people growing. And smallholder is a big range. So you may have a smallholder with 1 to 10, 1 to 20. So it's all a matter of fitting within the range. Yeah, it slightly brings us back to the market segmentation conversation we had on the first day. Yeah, all, from all our analysis that, that we've done in the context of SEBI live gaps have shown that what happens with the smallholder is that they start really depending very significantly on off-farm income. And the off-farm income component becomes up to 60, 70 percent of what the farmer is doing. As education increases and kids start going to school and everything, that can actually generate more feasible transitions for them to go. Because the problem of off-farm income is that then the farmer starts de-investing or not investing in in the farm simply because it's not the main source of income. So at the end of the day, uh, well, the, the incentive is simply not there because the major source is elsewhere. So. Uh, Ultimately, they will end up with an exit strategy led by also, well, changes in other dimensions like education, the peri-urban, the land values increasing that provide, op provide options for then selling, selling the farm and so on. Good. So we then move into differentiation where people actually are commercializing and others are getting out of agriculture. So, Sirak, you have a question from, from the group. Yep. Yeah, okay, the question from this table is, how do we measure impact across the uh, value chain? We, o we always try to see uh, impact and try to measure just the, uh, what's the impact of the one value chain. After it's mostly it focuses on producers. For example, if you do some intervention on milk improvement uh, intervention and then you increase the the milk production, and then you see, try to see the impact on producers. But what does that mean to other value chain actors? What does that mean to traders, milk collectors, or to cooperatives? And how do we measure that? Both exposed and ex ante, can we also predict impact? 
across the value chain. Okay, so Andrew? Okay, so it's not my area of expertise, but I showed a, a slide there of what we're now calling Ag GDP Plus, which attempts to do exactly this, is not just capture the uh, value at the productivity on farm level, but looks at the value addition downstream and segment that at different levels. Uh, there's a similar, so, so that would to some extent answer your question. And you know, I, this, this figure stuck in my head that in California, nine tenths of the value add in the food systems is off farm, is after the farm. So uh, you know, in some healthy world, you have got smallholder farmers who are transitioning out, but are being absorbed into the agri-food system and are making a better living, allowing more efficient practices on on farm to take place. So. I think that that's sort of what we're looking at. Very, it's very interesting to see how that's going to play out and to segment where we're seeing that kind of growth. We've also got a similar metric, and I should say we, it's if pre developed work, which looks at employment. And host governments and donors are looking increasingly at how these people who are transitioning out to what. If they're being forced out, they have to find some meaningful livelihood to fill the space that they, when they were previously agriculturalists. Otherwise, we start to drive conflict dynamics. So looking at how employment is being created, and I think as a, as a livestock sector, our value chains are very employment rich. So there's a, there's a lot of value addition after the farm. So there's a lot that we can sort of aim for. But to date, we, although this spillover effect is the absolute basis of ag-led growth, we've done a pretty poor job of claiming that as our success, and we've allowed national accounts to measure that as manufacturing. Okay, um, does that answer your question? Can I just add one more quick thing to that? So I think an interesting research thread, one of the cross-cutting themes um, that's emerged for us is around gender. So if we look across the value chain, you know, where are women participating? Is it just as producers? Can we upgrade their roles and sort of what the economic, what the impact on women's economic empowerment looks like, not just at the producer level, but across the, the other value chain roles as well? Good, okay, table five. Uh, I think we're gonna have to move on, Sirak, sorry. So ours is quick. We wanted to challenge the panel to do a handstand. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question. Uh, okay, so maybe Andy, you start then, yeah. <laughs> have a question. Yeah. Um, so we also had a question for Andrew and Belinda, which was, how do you measure progress towards the SDGs when the indicators are also disparate? So how do you measure progress towards the SDGs when the indicators are so disparate? Well, I don't want to answer either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It's a great question. Um, um, what can I say here? I think, I think what we are measuring at the high level tracks onto SDGs, poverty. Many of the key SDGs we can identify. We're not calling them the SDGs, but they map onto those, those end outcomes. Um, I think it's, there's a bit of politics tied around that, um, but we are not unaware of the SDGs, and I think we can pretty much align most of our work to clearly to specific SDGs. We are probably not, unfortunately, going to adopt that as our sort of results framework. Belinda? I agree with what Andrew said. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I think... Um, I mean, it's, it's not much different for the foundation. Um, you know, within our program teams, we have very specific metrics that we sort of tailor to our, our portfolios. But across the board, if you sort of aggregate, you know, what the foundation is, is driving towards, I think in some sort of loose qualitative way, you know, we hope it rolls up to the SDGs. Is that linkage going to be explicit necessarily in the framework, like Andrew was saying? I think probably probably not, but we do sort of track against those. Um, in, in a broader sense, I think. Good, okay. And finally, table five. Who's your spokesperson? Louise. Oh, Tim wants to say something. Um, yeah, no, can I just so, sort of exp add to that a bit? I mean, is, you know, given that the SDGs are what the international community has subscribed to, 
Is, is, a, is a sort of mapping to them in a, in a loose way sufficient as a, as a donor and international? So I'm going to tag in. Um, not that I have like the, the assured answer, but I think from a foundation perspective, there's absolutely activities that map to goalkeepers and tries to keep track of sort of global progress towards those goals. Um, and I think at a very strategic level, sort of in sort of the really high levels of the foundation management and leadership, they are tracking the progress towards those. But I think what's lacking is a concrete way to do just what we're talking about. We're talking about how hard it is to go from project level to portfolio level. So I think if the data community can help find viable pathways to those indicators and metrics that have been proposed, I think all of us would be open to figuring out how to map those back to our investments. So I think it's just been a lack of a tangible, concrete solution in that space, knowing what we're accountable for to our sort of or internal justifications, if that makes sense. And yeah, I would just say that I think they, I don't think they are that loose. There's, there's a subtle separation um, for at a sort of political level in the, the actual phraseology and wording. Some SDGs were absolutely locked onto, others uh, the obvious ones we're a little more distant from right now, but political cycles come and go, and those, those which ones we lock onto more tightly may well change. Um, but there's some core ones that I think all but, in all but name, we're doing them. Um, we just don't take that final small step. So I think there is reasonable tightness. It's not, it's not a sham where, yeah, we're aligning with them, but we're not really. I think we are. I, th I think Rose Wheater showed us a, f a fairly, you know, a, p a particular indicator that was linked to genetic resources, and that's possibly a fairly vague or, or over, you know, d d over inclusive one. There, there are possibly much more direct and, and usable indicators as well for other goals. Good. So, Louise, table five. So we actually had Belinda and Andrew on our table, so we did sort of ask what Pap said like to be asked. But one of the questions was, we've really looked at sort of numbers, but what about the role of more qualitative data? Can that fill some of the gaps as well? Sort of more participatory methods? Okay, so not just about numbers. Uh, who wants to speak to that one? Funny you ask. <laughs> <laughs> so I, in a previous life, I worked for Tufts University. And they did a lot of great work in the livestock sector, which I think many people will be familiar with, looking at participatory approaches to data gathering. And where in extremely weak data environments, this actually represents a very efficient way and accurate of getting a decent amount of data. And you know, whilst at the one hand we want to improve these national data sets and the quantitative survey work, there are these massive inherent problems with them, and it's going to be a long-range project to get the quality of that data up. Uh, in the meantime, I fear that we may be a rule, projects are not working, not, not that they are working, but we're not able to measure it, or they don't move the needle at the zone of influence level. And I think that there are much more subtle and precise techniques that we could use from participatory approaches uh, which can be semi-quantified, um, but they've been validated. There are publications and papers. I would draw your attention to Andy Catley's work in particular. And I wonder if this group um, could maybe surface some of those approaches as a real way. Maybe they can run in parallel to the national data set as a triangulation approach. But I think for value for money, uh, they represent a lot. Okay, so qualitative data. Does anyone else want to speak on that one? Giles. Yeah, I, I think one of the things, I'm not knocking them at all, um, but is that a lot of the statistical approach, when you're trying to evidence change, you really need some sort of statistical approach. And the statistical approaches are not as well known. They're not as set in stone, perhaps. Um, the massive advantage to these is to get good data, you have to get buy-in from your data provider. And your data provider ultimately is the farmer. And I think you'll get better buy-in from the farmer with a qualitative approach than with a fully quantitative approach. 
Good. Okay. I think we'll draw a line under that. I think that's been a great final session, um, quite an animated conversation afterwards. So let's uh, thank all the speakers again. And thank you to Andy for chairing that session. We just have a few things to mop up before lunch. Um, firstly, we had uh, Serafina and Alex uh, who were kind of watching the meeting. They're kind of data scientists and they were trying to pick up some ways in which uh, data scientists might be, help, be able to help us. Unfortunately, they had to leave, but Karen's just going to summarize on their behalf. Who knew I was a data scientist? <laughs> so um, I'm going to try and summarize very badly what they would have said. Um, so they, they, they feel there's lots of opportunities for the community. But I think um, what they really need w is to understand what your data looks like, understand are you trying to make predictions, find similarities, have you got repeatable data, how frequently it's co collected. They said they would prefer that you came with goals, what you want to achieve out of the data, rather than coming with questions, because often the questions have to be rewritten because you need to be able to know how to write it in the right way for, for, for data scientists. Um, they suggested that um, in, in Edinburgh we have uh, links into the Turin Institute and they have a, a data study group that meets three to f around three times a year and we could present a, a sort of a thematic um, uh, exercise, for example, uh, livestock and genetics, bring together a couple of our data sets and they could get a room full of people who are very interested in that particular problem and really drill into the data sets. So we can set, we want to achieve this, maybe to speed up the way in which the data is collated, or we want to look at um, a particular um, for a particular goal for the group and uh, work towards that. They also suggested a lookathon rather th and a, a hackathon, but the lookathon is really to understand what data you've got, what's the range, and and uh, what's doable with it. Um, and then a hackathon could be potentially after that. So maybe tagging on a half-day half workshop at the start of the meeting or the end of the meeting to explore some of these things could be quite good. Um, they said they'd be happy to take questions if you have questions for them and maybe they could be filtered through um, or email um, and we can follow up that way. So, yeah, sorry it's not more comprehensive but they had to check out by 12.30. <laughs> so they were a victim of the drifting timetable. Uh, good. So Julie Ojango had the unenviable task of trying to synthesize that session five and present us with a summary now. So I'm just going to ask her briefly with just highlights to, to tell us your, your kind of final synthesis of that session. Thanks. Um, yeah, it wasn't an easy task. <laughs> what is obvious is definitely that the way impact is measured really, really differs depending on the level um, or who is speaking. And what happens is whoever is involved in defining it really, really um, has to determine some trade-offs or has to you know, uh, dis decide that there's some things that can't be measured at this level have to be left out. And that often... Um, probably is to the detriment at lower levels, but it, but it would, it actually helps in, in being able to come up with something that is measurable. Um, when you're looking at the higher levels, at the global level, you're looking at that sometimes the statements can be quite ambiguous, you know, and very broad. So really it's for others then to try and narrow down and synthesize what is being said or what, what sort of impact um, they are striving to achieve. But um, <coughs> defining the scope um, sometimes is not clear to everybody. And you, you need to try and think in terms of simplifying the language that's <laughs> used. 
<laughs> and when I talk of simplifying, I'm like, oh Lord, and my language sometimes, I didn't, I wasn't able to simplify very, very many things. And it was very clear, one of the examples, particularly in the statistics, when you were coming down to what is actually measured um, and what you're defining and how that is interpreted at the higher levels. Because at the national level, it really looks important, but at the higher level, because it's been filtered through, it's not so evident. So the way in which it's defined makes it a bit difficult um, to, to see it being included. And what was also very interesting is that, you know, it always has to be clear that livestock itself is not always the interesting factor, it's just a tool to achieving um, what the, the goal is, okay? And a lot of the times, people within the livestock sector forget that. And they over-focus, we geneticists have that challenge, we over-focus on the livestock, forgetting it's just a tool as a means. And so, you know, if you understand a lot better what's happening in terms of those who are aggregating and those who really want questions answered, then you will see its importance and how to measure impact and look at what the indicators for impact should be rather than focusing around, around the livestock alone. And yeah, so you're looking at um, also the, me the way you measure, you look at your impact pathways or you look at the ways, you know, you have to be very clear on how it cascades down right down to the lower level and what sort of impacts they should be measuring that, that actually are clarified um, to them. Th so that's, that's really what I got from the different presentations. Um, uh, the session on questions, I missed half of, the <laughs> half of them, <laughs> I admit. But um, one of the things is um, a lot of times um, the multifunctionality of livestock is not is really not measured, and, and although we, we try to emphasize that and think of it as important, and we're looking at, you know, what really should the metric be? Should the same metric be used across the different levels? And the whole issue of the transition that is anticipated f across the smallholder systems and how that should be measured, and also the balance between who benefits, the producers, the consumers, um, where should profitable livelihoods actually be measured? Those are some of the questions I got. I missed very many. No, that's great, Julie. Uh, didn't she do well? <laughs>